This is a special episode of the Immunology Podcast, Immunology 2024, Day 1. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Rapp. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have conversations with immunologists. As you know, today launched the start of Immunology 2024, the annual meeting of the American Associations of Immunologists here in Chicago. And Brenda and myself and the Immunology Podcast team are all attending. Drop by the Immunology Podcast booth, that's booth 708 in the exhibit hall, to play some games, win a prize, and find out how you could be featured on an episode of the podcast. Today and every day throughout the meeting, we'll be releasing special episodes discussing our favorite sessions the previous day. So if you weren't able to attend, we've got you covered. We're going to kick things off in just a moment, but before we get to that... Join Stem Cell Immunology 2024 for their mouse T-cell workshop at 1 p.m. on Sunday, May 5th in the Exhibitor Hall Workshop Room 2. This workshop will feature workflow solutions to streamline your mouse T-cell research from isolation to expansion. We also invite you to join Stem Cell's networking social event this Sunday night, starting from 7 p.m. at the Fat Poor Tab Works, located at 2206 South Indiana Avenue. See you there. Jason and I will be attending. All right. Well, you came in yesterday, right, Brenda? I did. You needed some time for the for the jet lag to to wash off. I'm remembering that from our last conference and your comments on jet lag. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. It's a six hours, you know, they're wrong, the wrong way, so it's hard. There's a right way? There is no right way. Yeah. That, yeah, I guess you have a point. Hmm. But I, I plowed through. I made it to the, you know, late evening. So actually, I think I'm correcting it. There you go. We'll see tomorrow. We'll see how much coffee you take every day. <laughs> yeah, just just enough. Just enough. And I flew in this morning, so uh, I also got up very early to be here. But here we are, and we already got the first sessions in. They had about a good 90-minute block of uh, sessions to kick off the afternoon. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So why don't you just, you know... Dive right in. Dive right in, yeah. Migrate right to where I'm going. All right, well, I am going to be talking about innate and innate light cells, see how they migrate, was the name of our talk. So they, these are all 15-minute talks. So if you ask me for in-depth questions, I, I cannot give in-depth answers here because they, they went a little uh, fast because, you know, these are the highlight reels. So a couple of really cool uh, talks I saw one was by Vanessa Borges out of Cedar sinai and she was looking at hyperthermia and its role in protecting against ventilator-induced lung injury. Uh, and if you guys remember, we were talking about ARDS, and after you get an infection, the ventilator can often cause damage and exacerbate that ARDS. We talked about that uh, on a podcast recently. And her role was, the, the formal name of the talk is, Hyperthermia Protects Against Ventilator-Induced Lung Injury by Eliminating Gas Dermin D Activation. Oh my God. And everywhere. net formation. It's gas dermin D is everywhere you don't want it to be. Gas dermin D all the way down. It's my new pet. Yeah, I, I noticed that. Yeah. Move along and enterocytes. Gas dermin D is coming. But what if what if someone studies gas dermin D in enterocytes? Well, there's no good off track. No, yeah. So sorry, I wasn't migrating in the right spot. I got confused. <laughs> I lost my molecular compass. All right. So uh, ne neutrophil extracellular trap is something is a structure neutrophils form, and it's part of their pathology. They, they didn't go super in detail about this, but what they were showing was that in this LPS plus ventilator injury model, which is what they're using, if you depleted neutrophil depletion with an anti-Li6 antibody, you were able to limit the injury without affecting IL-1 beta release. So IL-1 beta levels are the same, neutrophils gone, less injury. Okay, so neutrophils, bad actors in lung injury. We kind of know that. Neutrophil extracellular traps, though, if you eliminate IL-1 beta signaling, they go away. So obviously you can't have a trap without a neutrophil, but you'd have a neutrophil without a trap, right? So then they looked at, well, what part of the pathway is important for neutrophils making neutrophil traps? And that was the IL-1, R1 receptor. So that prevents net formation, um, neutrophil, but that prevented net, so if you knock it out, you prevent net formation, but it doesn't alter neutrophil migration or IL-1 beta release. So that's the proximal receptor for the IL-1 beta activation leading to net formation. Then they were able to show that hypothermia, so cooling people down, or in this case, mices, uh, inhibits net formations by controlling macrophage IL-1 beta release. And it does that by macrophage gas dermin mediation, right? So you have macrophages release IL-1 beta through gas dermin D cleavage, and that leads to net formation in vitro. And if you cool them down, that happens less. So that was that paper. There was, uh, real quickly, a couple other highlights. Um, Sherry Eisman from Columbia 
looking at natural killer cells and understanding how their development and migration work. And her title of her talk is the role of CXCR4-CXCL12 in the development and migration of human natural killer cells. So that that set, CXCR4-CXCL12, is a known pairing between kinokine and receptor for uh, that plays a role in cell proliferation and survival migration. What she showed using tonsil tissue, which is where NK cells are develop a lot, is that the position in the tissue matters for its development. And they did this with some automated cell migration tracking pipeline. They have a new paper coming out in BioArchives with the software they use for some of the data visualization. So it's the same uh, analysis tools have been there, but a downstream visualization tool that's a little different for an analysis. Uh, but the same cell tracking software was used as previous, as people have done for a while. Uh, what she showed is that if you inhibit this linkage, this, this coupling, you have less NK cell generation. And what she showed what happens is, is that th this is an adhesion, right? And so if you're migrating down a line, you're getting exposed to different chemicals. And you need to pause and stay at one spot and be exposed to certain chemicals in order to become a mature NK cell. And if you block adhesion, that doesn't happen. So you need to pause and take a minute and smell the roses to grow up. Oh, how, how poetic. Aww. All right. Um, and then there, there's, there was like six or seven talks, but one of the other ones that really stuck with me was Uma Kanthedi from the University of Colorado. Her title was Antibody Blockade of Cis PDL1 and CD8 Interactions on Dendritic Cells Dictate Chemokine Driven Migration During Inflammation. All right. High level, we know PD-1 blockade. So, so we know dendritic cells migrate during inflammatory responses and you know, that this is affected by PD-1, right? So interesting, PD-1 inhibitors don't alter DC migration, but PD-L1 inhibition does. So, you know, but, but how does this be? It's PD-1, PD-L1, that's what binds. Well, no. Oh, no. There is an, another ligand. There is PDL1 CD80 interactions as well. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I've heard of that. So that's what matters. And it's specifically a tyrosine 56 moiety because they used a bunch of PDL1 antibodies and the ones that bound most tightly to tyrosine 56 based on structure function modeling. So, you know, the structure of molecular docking, that matters most. So that was cool. And then lastly, Jian, Jian Yu of University of Iowa looked at the role of fat in psoriasis. And their title of their talk was FABP5 promotes saturated high fat exacerbated psoriatic inflammation. So eating too much high fat diet causes you to have worse psoriasis. This is something that's been described before. This work showed that saturated but not unsaturated high fat diets made things worse in their mouse model of amiquimod treated skin. And this is due to increased vulnerability to neutrophil infiltration. And they showed that this was through fatty acid binding protein 5. So if you knock out FABP5, you have uh, less psoriasis. And this is all mediated by an IL-1, IL-17 level. So knock it out. High saturated fat diets no longer mm. induce IL-1, IL-1. It's complete beta, knockout? Yeah, you know, pan tissue knockout. Okay. So there you go. So that's, that, those are the ones that I presented today. All right. Thanks for sharing, Jason. So for my side, I attended the session on transplant immunology, uh, ongoing interest of mine, and I thought it was very nice. Uh, first off was Karina Rodriguez Lima from Mass General Hospital, the transplantation unit, and her talk was uh, titled Cyclic E is a novel co-inhibitory receptor in the modulation of innate uh, activation after transplantation. And basically that's kind of, the, the the title tells uh, tells a lot of it. So she she looked at this molecule, sialic acid binding immuno, immunoglobulin like lectin, so singlic. And there are different several different uh, versions of this molecule, but she focused on singlic E. So she looked into transplantation and she saw uh, that if you have a singlic, singlic E knockout, you have a much increased uh, rejection of a, a, tr a transplant. In this case. Uh, she was looking into kidney, if I remember correctly. And so the the mechanism behind this was that the absence of cyclic uh, E on dendritic cells resulted in an increase of uh, the dendritic cell activation, basically. 
Uh, you have more uh, uh, expression of MHC in different gamma, causing material molecules. So in a way, this molecule was uh, preventing the activation of dendritic cells and thus the activation of uh, allogeneic T cells. And so th she showed that this was mediated by NF-kappa beta activation on dendritic cells. And so they kind of reach out to a model in which the signaling of cyclic A uh, is interfering with NF-kappa beta function and that uh, therefore um, this can uh, help reduce the uh, allogeneic activation of T cells by these dendritic cells. So I guess this has a very interesting, you know, of course, very therapeutic uh, possibility, maybe by increasing cyclic E signaling, or in a way it shows why this this kind of uh, this uh, cyclic molecules, which are known from being for being modulating, immunomodulating, this is another way in which they are modulating the the immune system in general. So after a 15 minute break, I have we have uh, Michael Nicosia from the. Lerner Research Institute at Cleveland Clinic, and he talked about LAC3 uh, and how it can regulate antibody responses following kidney transplantation. So he started off with antibody-mediated rejection of uh, kidney, and how that is, of course, a major uh, a major source of of rejection uh, in, in general in transplantations and particularly in kidney. So LAC3, on the other hand, you have LAC3 which is this well-known molecule, kind of active, very well-established in T cells. Uh, it is expressed in, 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 in several types of T cells, but not particularly, I would say, um, uh, the regulatory T cells. And the, the ligands of LAC3 uh, are various, but I think the most well-known is MHC class 2, also uh, uh, GAL3. But it is not very well-known what is uh, with LAC3 in B cells. So he, what it, what his, in his research, he kind of looked into like three expression uh, upon you know, in, a, in a kidney and a rejection kidney rejection model, and he shows that in fact like three is also expressed on B cells, but particularly on plasma B cells, and she shows that um, in those transplants that are stably uh, tolerated. There is there is a clear detection of LAC3 in, in 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 slides and in the samples both from human and mouse. So there's this there seems to be also a correlation between LAC3 expression and induction of tolerance. And this relates to what we see in LAC3, for example, in in uh, cancer, in which LAC3 is negatively related to cancer rejection. So I guess it it, it kind of makes sense. So he has LAC3 knockout mice, and what he shows is that. These mice are much have a higher development of aller allo-reactive responses, and this is already before transplantation. So they have already a baseline of allo-reactive T cells that is higher than the normal mice, and they reject they uniformly reject uh, a graft in this case a CH3 kidney to a black six mouse, and this looks and it has a lot of the uh, hallmarks of an antibody mediated rejection. So he finds expression again in in like three of uh, in normal mice. Like three is expressed not only in, on T follicular helpers, but only but also on plasma cells and not in other types of B cells. So uh, what 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 they suggest is a you know, so our correlation of like three expression uh, can uh, reduce uh, the, the 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 rejection and it can affect both T cells and B cells. So they can act through expression on B cells and uh, T cells and B cells. Next up, we had uh, Ismail Sayin from the University of Chicago. And again, talking about antibodies, antibody reactions in after transplantation. But I think this was cool because he was talking about autoreactive B cells. So it makes sense that you think, well, B cells generated against the kidney uh, graft or the, the, the transplanted tissue. Makes sense, all those, uh, those other antigens that are specific to this tissue. But then what he pointed to, which I think we already knew, is that in fact, there's not only antibodies against clearly foreign antigens from the transplant, but also you end up finding a considerable amount of autoreactive antibodies, you know, like autoantigens, nuclear antigens, things like that. Um, and so he, he looks into the, the, comp to the generation of these two types of either donor-specific antibodies and autoantibodies in the context of acute rejection in kidney, and how, for example, although we have treatments such as CTLA-4 immunoglobulin, CTLA-4 has been very promising in, re in reducing acute rejection in kidney transplants. And he showed that although it can prevent the development of donor-specific antibodies, it does not affect the development of autoantibodies 
in, uh, uh, in acute rejection. And this might have to do with the fact that he sees that the donor-specific antibody response is primarily generated, it's generated both in the spleen and in the allo, allo um, graft, whereas the self-autoreactive response seems to be almost exclusively developed within the allograft. So they have kind of completely different uh, kinetics and, and, and places where these two responses are, are generated. And uh, and it's interesting because then, although Ig and uh, CTLA uh, immunoglobulin has been very promising for uh, donor specific antibody uh, rejection, these autoantibodies can still generate despite this treatment. And he well, he had a little bit of data about the pathogenicity of the antibodies, and he shows that indeed, for at least when it comes to complement activation, these antibodies can activate a complement, which would suggest that there are you know true pathogenic antibodies. Um, but I think it's very interesting because I don't think we think um, enough about what happens when you know you are end up targeting your own cells because of the whole inflammation that is generated during the uh, transplantation. And just for the end, I really like the um, uh, talk from Jesse Barra, the University of Florida, because she looked into a very I think it was very cool how to protect a transplanted transplanted uh, uh, cells with CAR T Rex when. So if you don't have, so you, a car needs a target, right? Something that's press on the surface in order to direct it against that. So he says, well, if we cannot find anything on these cells that we can, you know, target, why don't we add something to, uh, you know, stem cells? And then if we have like uh, cells derived from uh, uh, pluripotent stem cells, then we will, they will all be expressing this, this antigen and we can direct CAR T-Rex against that antigen and then protect. So that's basically what he did. They introduced a truncated EGFR uh, sequence into human pluripotent stem cells, and then a car on T-Rex that recognized this EGFR. And then basically they show that you can you know, generate the car, the T-Rex are functional, they are regulatory. You can generate, uh, um, you can differentiate, for example, beta cells from this human uh, pluripotent stem cells that are expressing truncated EGFR. And then if you test that, if you put them in, you know, in in vitro and in vivo, you can see that actually these T-Rex are protecting. So they get activated when they're co-culture with this modified uh, uh, stem cells and their uh, resulting uh, um, uh, cells, like for example, beta cells. And that actually they even do an in vivo uh, engraftment of, of, of stem cell derived beta cells. Uh, and they show that T-Rex can protect the graft under these circumstances. I thought, I thought it was very nice. I mean, that that's super cool for being able to have the T regs do that. I guess I guess the question is now with all the CAR T cell risks that are being described, is is the profile worth it? Like obviously, if you have lethal cancer, having a risk of cancer in twenty yeah. years is who cares, right? <laughs> Can, yeah, that's true. <laughs> lethal cancer now, cancer twenty years from now, maybe. Right, maybe. Right, or very maybe. Like. But th this is interesting. Well, the question is that if you're going to die if, because you cannot protect your, if you, I don't know, if there's certain transplants that you need and you keep rejecting them. Yeah. So, yeah, if you have transplant rejection over and over and over and over and over again. So, um, and then there was another talk about similar protecting cells by expressing, in this case, thromomodulin and CD147. You know, this not, don't eat me signal on also islet cells. And I thought it was very nice uh, for um, Mohamed Tariq from the University of Missouri. And basically, they used this, this ProtX platform to display CD47 and uh, thromomodulin on the surface of uh, islet cells, and that this could protect them from this um, particular type of rejection or particular type of, uh, of engraft problem for engraftment, which is instant blood mediated inflammatory reaction. Uh, and so I think it's also very nice by kind of coating the cells with this. They, they, they protect and they maintain the, in the integrity after exposure to blood, and also they seem to engraft better in an in vivo model. So transplantation, immunology, very interesting. A lot to do in there. Yeah, well, seeing some of those transplants are, is, is mm -hmm. a powerful thing. All right, well, with that, that brings us to the end of our first Immunology 2024 episode. Don't forget to follow us on X at Immunology Podcast to find out what we're up to at the meeting and visit us 
at the Immunology Podcast booth on the exhibitor floor where you can win a gift basket. Check back here tomorrow for another episode recapping day two of the meeting. See you then.